All right, we have another installment of The Housewife and The Hustler, and we've got a lot of Vanderpump talk that we're going to be doing with Vanderpump Robs. I hope you all ready for it. Let's get it. You're listening to No Filter with Zach Peter, your go-to source for all the latest pop culture and reality TVT, Sir Fresh, all week long. Now, let's dive in. What up, guys? Happy Tuesday. I hope you are having a great start to your week. Hopefully, you enjoyed your Monday. I'm hoping I get to see a lot of you guys tomorrow night at the Bourbon Room in Hollywood. You can still get your tickets at nofilterlive.com. There's a link in the description below. Come on out. We're going to have a good time. We're going to have lots of fun. Come on out for a night of love. Rack of love. Um, I recommend you wear your best concert band tee. It's going to be a rock of love themed night. We're going to have fun. We're going to get lit. We're going to play some games. We're going to spill some tea. We're going to recap some reality TV. And let's dive into it, shall we? Um, I do have Vanderpump Robs on. He'll be on in just a bit. But first, I wanted to start by recapping. <sighs> I watched it. All of it. The Housewife and the Hustler to The Reckoning. I tuned in just for you, made sure I'd watched it all the way through before forming an opinion, fought with some bitches on Twitter over it, because, you know, people are like, I saw a documentary and now I'm a journalist. I've cracked the code. It's like, okay, Sherlock Holmes, calm down. So I watched it. As you guys know, I just want to remind everybody, especially if you're new here, I have dove very deep into this Girardi scandal over the past three years, followed it from the beginning. Um, I've chatted with multiple attorneys um, on the record and off the record on this podcast and off of this podcast. I've talked to many former clients of Girardi Keese. I've had some of them on this podcast. I've sat, sat down and done interviews with them, former employees of Girardi Keese, Um, Again, on and off the record, I've also talked to a number of journalists that have also investigated this, that have helped me investigate it, that that helped me obtain access to court documents. I had on a representative from the California State Bar that came on here and spoke to the corruption within the state. So I've had Erica Jane for her first and only one hour sit down interview where she got into the marriage. She addressed the Marco Marco case. She talked about meeting the the victims. So yeah, I've there's not been one I can really flex on that. There has not been one other podcaster or content creator that has dug deep into this. There are a lot of really great uh, legal commentators, former attorneys. We have Emily D. Baker, who I've had on the show a number of times, who I've spoken with, again, on the record, off the record, on this podcast, all of it. She's been an incredible resource for me. She does a great job covering it as well. She's also featured in The Housewife and The Hustler, too. Big fan of Emily's. Love Emily. She was great, giving great coverage for the Amber Heard case. Um, but again, like I, like I said, I have interviewed on this podcast, former clients, California State Bar, and Erica Girardi herself. I am one of the only content creators that has done all of that, read through the court documents. So I understand the ins and outs. And yes, I also knew about the Marco Marco case. So going into this, so let's talk about the beginning, right? Because we have the trailer that comes out, which heavily focuses on the sit down that Erica Jane has with former clients of Girardi Keese. We have Nancy, who was the, um, she was, she wrote a book, um, The Serpent, oh my God, I'm blanking on the exact name, Some The Serpent something, Serpent, Serpent Tail, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the name, I have the book somewhere in the office. Um, Nancy was there, we don't really hear much from her in it, we see Kimberly Archie there, we see um, Joe Rui Gomez's mother, and then there was one other woman, I don't remember who she was, but we see her. She was one of the uh, former clients as well. She's heavily featured in the documentary. So we do see these are the four women that sit down with Erica that day, which was um, an ice cream launch party that Kimberly Archie was hosting in honor of her son. I was there that day. I believe in some of like the footage that you see towards the end of this documentary. You see me in the background. You see my brother. I came there with my dog and my brother, and we came to support the ice cream launch. Um but when I saw the trailer, which I got tipped off about the trailer a little early, and I got tipped off that there was a housewife and the hustler too. I believe I was the first one to report that there was a part two coming out before the official trailer dropped the following day. But 
I remember initially watching the trailer and thinking, whoa, that was not the footage that was being filmed that day. It was not supposed to be part of the Housewife and the Hustler part two. Um, I don't think that that information was ever disclosed to Erica. I don't think that that information was ever disclosed to Erica's attorney that there was a Housewife and the Hustler part two and this footage was going to be used for that. It appears... From my recollection of that day, I'm not making any accusations. Um, This is merely my own conjecture um, with some speculation based off of the pieces that I've put together. But it looks like Erica's attorney and Erica were led to believe that this meeting was going to be one thing. And the footage was then sold off to Hulu to make A Housewife and the Hustler Part 2. So when I saw this footage used in The Housewife and the Hustler Part 2, I was very disappointed to see that because I thought that this was a very powerful moment. I thought that this that the LA Times was going to, you know, upstand their journalistic integrity and actually do something um, prolific with this footage and reducing it to another Hulu tabloid documentary to me is just very equivalent of, you know, a National Enquirer documentary, right? So... Those are my feelings going into it. I was already like, this feels deceptive with the, because I remember what I was told that Erica's attorney was told in order to get them to show up that day. And it was that this was a very different project, a very different documentary, which I believe is probably why Erica didn't bring Bravo cameras, right? She didn't bring Bravo into this because it seemed like she wanted this to have some sort of integrity and not to be a housewives Bravo shtick. Right. Because I believe that when you are dealing with people that were wronged to the degree that these people were wronged by Tom Girardi and Girardi Keys and the people that were involved with the law firm, I believe that there is some integrity and there is some respect that needs to be done, you know, to tell their stories correctly without capitalizing off of them to make a penny. So I was I had a lot of mixed or not even mixed feelings, just very strong feelings about this part two of Housewife and the Hustler. But I decided to give it a shot anyway. In watching it, the first, the bulk of it really is um, not a whole lot of new information. We see the Rui Gomez family, their story is being told again, which was the the feature of part one. Um, it's kind of catching us up to speed. So I'm like, okay, you know, we're getting the story again. We're getting updates. We're being told that now the Rui Gomez family is getting their settlement money. The settlements are being dispersed. To me, there wasn't a whole lot of new information that was featured in this documentary, but there was a lot of Housewives footage that was featured in this documentary, which I found was very interesting because I'm like, what is this documentary about? It's called The Reckoning, but what is The Reckoning of? What are we reckoning exactly? Because in terms of the information about Girardi Keys, there's not a whole lot of new information that we didn't get from the first documentary that, that's being featured in this documentary, number one. You can watch Housewife and the Hustler part one. Two, we had a lot of just random mixes in of Erica's footage from Real Housewives of Beverly Hills, which she did a full sit down one hour interview. I will be very clear. The LA Times, ABC News, Hulu, none of them reached out looking to air any of that footage or use any of that footage where Erica does answer a lot of the questions that are brought up in The Housewife and the Hustler too. So they could have very likely, we talk about the victims, we talk about the Marco Marco case, we talk about her marriage to Tom. Um, there was a headline that was featured that was pulled from my interview, but they showed the headline. They did not show my interview. Listen, I'm not salty about not, them not showing the interview. If anything, it's fine that they didn't. I, I'm completely fine with them not showing my interview. Hulu or um, other documentaries have reached out to use my footage. I asked them for a fee to use my footage. They declined because they don't, I, to my understanding, they don't pay anybody involved in these documentaries. I believe Heather McDonald has also revealed that because I think she was in uh, The Housewife and the Hustler Part 1 with Dana Wilkie and Danielle Staub. So that's kind of the caliber and the level that we're dealing with here. Even though they did have some really good sources, they had Emily D. Baker in it. Um, Matt from the LA Times is very featured in it. It seemed like everybody, you know, Matt and Kimberly Archie, they were all ready for their close-ups. They came ready to have the cameras on them. Um, But listen, you had great commentators like uh, Emily D. Baker, who's an attorney, who's very experienced. You had someone like Kate Casey, who's the host of Reality Life with Kate Casey. She's done, you know, a tremendous amount of work into, you know, interviewing Jay Edelson and other attorneys. And, you know, Kate Casey has also done her due diligence as well. So I have a lot of respect for some of the people that are featured in the documentary. Others, I 
felt like we're really kind of <laughs> gloating in their camera time. Um, but that said, I don't feel like there was any new information. It did feel like that it was a bit of a a character attack on Erica. And I feel even weird kind of saying that because my whole thing is it's like, this shouldn't be about Erica. Like, why are you talking? Why are you spending so much time pulling footage from The Real Housewives, which is an entertainment show? It's The Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. How are we using that as the basis content for your documentary? Shouldn't your documentary be investigating what Tom Girardi actually did? Oh, wait, we already have that documentary. It's The Housewife and the Hustler Part 1. So Part 2, the only real bit of information that's new from Part 1 to Part 2 is the fact that there was the competency hearing, which we now know was being filmed. You know, everyone that attended that competency hearing this documentary was filming for that. I remember being invited to attend that. And to me, I just, I was like, listen, I got to, I know it's here in downtown. I am not going to spend my day going to the courthouse to watch this hearing. Um, I did have friends that were there that I would, you know, kind of get little debriefs from. But I I was going to try to make it one day. I had no idea that, that they were being filmed. Um, and I actually don't feel too badly about that like seeing them go to lunch after that and kind of toasting and cheersing and you know kind of just making light of the situation to me just something about that didn't sit well with me I told you there was an interview that I had conducted that I didn't end up airing that I scrapped because I just felt like the one integrity behind it and the words that were said on mic and off mic just didn't align with you know I you know believed were genuine um, so I chose, chose to scrap that interview altogether, but the most we get out of this is bits of the competency hearing, which we don't see any footage of the hearing itself. We just see Tom Girardi leaving the courthouse. We see, you know, these women that met with Erica that are toasting and cheersing to justice. I'd, I'm not entirely sure what the, the debrief from that lunch actually was meant to accomplish. I don't know what this part two was meant to accomplish, but it was very focused on Erica. And my thing is, it's like, why are we a picking apart Erica's character when there has still been nothing that legally ties to Erica? Even the earrings were barely touched on in the documentary. A lot of it focused on this case um, involving designer Marco Marco which to me is also a little strange and slightly skewed considering Marco Marco is trying to sue Erica Girardi. So the merit behind their interview and what they're claiming, I think when somebody has a vested interest like a lawsuit, their word doesn't necessarily hold as much weight in my eyes because it's like, oh, well, you're trying to prove a case. I mean, perfect example, Brandy Glanville is building a case against Bravo, right? She went and did an interview, I believe it was with ET, I think it was with Bryce Sander, and she was talking about her health issues and she's laying down this foundation about how the stress that was induced from, you know, them not airing the footage from Real Housewives Ultimate Girls Trip Morocco, how that uh, impacted her health. And so when you see somebody and they do an interview like that and they're giving, they're laying down this foundation, it's laying down the foundation for the lawsuit that they're looking to pursue, right? They just need it documented and out there so that way it can help their case, both within the court of public, public opinion and within building the foundation of their case for their court hearing as well. Um, so the Marco Marco stuff. The story that's presented, which again, I have no idea how this relates to Tom. Well, I guess it kind of relates to Tom Girardi because it makes it seem like Tom Girardi used his influence to get the feds to, you know, bully this designer, right? That's kind of the narrative that's being painted, even though it then is revealed in the documentary that Tom didn't really have any association with this case specifically. It was more of Erica who had reached out to somebody that she knew investigated this um, and then they decided to pursue it on their own. Um, and it seems like Tom Girardi himself didn't have much of a hand in what was going on based off of what was presented in this documentary. And I use the word documentary very lightly because that's a term that we throw around very lightly these days. And that's not a dig at, Netflix, at Hulu because I feel like Netflix and other streaming services have, all, have also kind of done the same thing. And these documentaries are no longer what I would consider to have the integrity of a, of a documentary. But so the Marco Marco case is where there are these designers that claim that 
um, Erica, that they were designing costumes for Erica and I'm paraphrasing, but they were designing costumes for Erica and they were charging her card and suddenly she started questioning the disputes and their narrative is that they were running out of money and so she needed to hold on to this money and that's why she disputed these charges and then were a wire to have them arrested and put into jail and they wanted to keep him in jail but luckily he was able to make bond and get out of jail and await his hearing and you know ultimately in the end the charges were dismissed and so now they're suing Erica and they're suing um, American Express and they're suing or they're pursuing litigation against Erica, American Express and um, the feds, which is interesting. <laughs> but um, my understanding, because I, again, I remember hearing about a lot of this stuff and investigating a lot of this stuff prior to coming out in this documentary, from what I remember, which is kind of touched on in the documentary as well, they were charging Erica's Amex for costumes without showing any billing, right? So they were just charging the card for whatever they wanted to charge it for, you know, however they wanted to charge it. And my thing is, it's like, well, how many times have us lay people saw a charge for $25, $50, $100, and we immediately call our credit card companies and we're like, hey, I don't know what this charge is for. I want to dispute it and immediately dispute that charge, right? Happens all the time. We do it all the time. We consider it fraud. We don't think about it. The second we see something, the second we see a penny of our money being put towards something we did not authorize, we immediately act on it, right? So then we bring in this case with Marco Marco and Erica Girardi. And it is basically a case where they were fashion designers that were helping her design costumes for her shows, for her appearances, whatever. And it was, I believe around 800,000 that they were billing her, that they were not billing her, charging her for, charging the Amex. I believe the total was up to around $800,000 within that, that range, right? They were not invoicing her. So when Erica asked, what are these charges? They're like, oh, we can pull together the invoices for you, which is convenient to put together an invoice after the charge has already been made, right? Again, if we were put in that situation and we were charged $25 for something that we never were that was never disclosed to us, I always like itemized breakdowns. Show me exactly where the money is coming from. Show me where all the bills are coming from. Trust me, I have my manager now and I'm just like, before we pay anything, we need an itemized detailed report of what exactly is being charged and we have to review what we authorized, what we didn't authorize, what's getting tackled on after the fact, what was discussed originally, what's in the contract, all of that sort of stuff, right? What's a fair amount for a tip if a tip is appropriate in a certain instance, all of that stuff, right? So then when it comes down to... They claim, oh, well, we were sending her the invoices, but my understanding is there was apparently some sort of infraction with what the invoices were claiming and what was actually being charged. So then Erica agrees to have a sit down with them. She sits down, unbeknownst to the Marco Marco guys, there was a wire that was being worn by Erica because this was an investigation. Again, this was charges in the amount of around $800,000. 800 grand, that's nearly one, right? If I'm doing the math right. That's nearly a million dollars, That's just under a mil, um, more than three quarters of a mil. We find out that they end up saying, oh, yes, there were discrepancies, and I think we may have accidentally overcharged you $100,000. That is what they admitted. That is what is on the wire, right? Because Erica was wearing a wire at the time. So, And it was a government investigation because the government was actively pursuing this. It's funny because everyone's like, oh, well, Erica had the government in her pocket. She was telling the government to do this. And it's like, oh, you guys are really giving her a lot of credit now. She was really, if she had the government in her pocket like that, I feel like she would be a little less in the mess that she's in right now. But okay, we'll go with that. But so they openly admit to at least $100,000 that were improperly charged. Now all of a sudden they're on Hulu and saying, oh, actually we went back and we itemized every single thing. Again, it's very convenient to itemize everything after the fact, right? After the money has already been taken, then you start to learn to explain every little dot and T and everything, right? Okay. But so it's interesting. Even Amex, 
issued a statement and they're just like, listen, yes, we absolutely reversed the charges. We had a fraud protocol. This is the protocol we go through anytime a client disputes a charge. And listen, I know what that's like. I remember when I was working for a nonprofit foundation, there was a donor that agreed to pay $20,000 as a donation to the charity. And then afterwards went to American Express and had them reverse the charge. Um, and American Express reversed the charge because he claimed he never authorized that, or he claimed, I forgot what he claimed exactly, but American Express reversed that charge. They do have, you know, in, an investigation. They have a frauds department, all of that. So in this case, they reversed the charges for the full amount that Marco Marco had originally charged Erica. Now, do I love that that it was a reversal of the full amount? Not exactly, you know, because I do believe that as fashion designers, they are entitled to something. They are owed for their work. They are owed for their supplies, right? They make an honest living the same way we all do. Um, but when there are discrepancies in your charges and your invoices aren't adding up and then you admit on record because it was on a wire on a recording that you like how do you just accidentally overcharge someone a hundred thousand dollars I get it when you know you're a big roller and you got that kind of money but like how do you accidentally overcharge somebody and admit that you accidentally overcharge somebody a hundred thousand dollars even you admitting that alone shows that there's some sort of discrepancy in your books which is why I do find it interesting after the fact, all this time later, they're like, oh, no, we went back and we discovered that we ac- we didn't accidentally overcharge you $100,000. Like I said, we would fight a $25 charge on our credit cards, let alone a hundred grand, let alone 800 grand in charges total without the invoices to actually prove it. And then you start to, to, you know, produce invoices after the fact, like something about that just didn't seem fully ethical from my perspective. So I understand the disputing of the charges. Now, the FBI getting involved, that to me is a little extra. And I get why they're trying to now, you know, fight back on that. Um, But so I did like the Marco Marco stuff to me, just it wasn't a strong enough case. They're actively suing Erica Girardi. So I feel like there's a little bit of, of, you know, bias involved in their their testimonials in this documentary. You know, I think when you have a vested interest like a lawsuit and you're trying to pursue legal action against somebody that includes some sort of monetary, you know, value that you're trying to gain, I think that makes it a little more challenging for me to, you know, take what you're saying at face value. So the Marco Marco stuff, even though people think like, oh my God, yes, Erica has the feds in her pocket and she got them to act on it. I think that that's a bit of a, of a stretch. You know, it does seem like there was a little bit of weight that was being pushed around, but it also seems like they were trying to definitely dip as deep as they can go because they saw, you know, an unlimited Amex that they wanted to run. And it's like, well, no, you're going to overcharge me a hundred grand. Well, then, yeah, I don't want anything that I've paid you because now I feel like this is completely dishonest. So, yeah, let's reverse the entire charge. And you know what? Until you can actually prove to me what I actually owe you, we ain't paying up. They make it seem like, oh, well, Tom Girardi was just hurting for money. And because he was hurting for money, that's why they did this whole reversal thing. When it didn't really become clear that money was hurting because we were taking clients allegedly taking client settlement funds and using them however we wanted didn't really seem like the card the house of cards came tumbling down until about 2020 which is um you know when the lawsuit started to come forth and then edelson was really pursuing it and erica filed for divorce and it seemed like everything just kind of crumbled so i don't know But the end of the documentary, I think, gets better. I feel like the last 10 minutes when we really see the full piece of the footage of Erica sitting down with the former clients of Girardi Keese, you know, some people felt like there wasn't a whole lot of empathy that she had. I remember that day. I remember speaking to these women after they met with Erica. You don't even need to take my word for it because page six, um has the direct quotes that I feel like I should just read for you so that way we can refresh everybody's memory because I know some of these women have now gone on the internet and they've changed their tune towards Erica, which I find very interesting. Um, I mean, and maybe it's just that they feel like they haven't really heard from her. They don't feel like she's really done anything. But it's like, what do you 
want her to do? What do you expect her to do? Is kind of my question. Um, Listen, I think, you know, there is a level of empathy that she could have had earlier on. She explains that in the documentary. I think that, um, you know, I I want closure for everyone. Maybe closure is not the right term, but I I want healing to begin for everyone. And I want the corruption that's happening within the system to be dismantled. I don't feel like this documentary does that. Oh, The Serpent's Tooth was the name of the book. So this is written by Evan Real, who is a reporter at Page Six, who accompanied me that day for the ice cream launch party that Kimberly Archie hosted. Um, And here's the Page Six article. After her conversation with Jane Marsden, who doesn't consider herself a victim, tells Page Six that the women are in a good place. She will further detail her involvement with Girardi in her upcoming book, The Serpent's Tooth, on August 15th. Quote, I think we're moving on. I think that maybe we could help each other, Marsden says. We can help some of the victims. Meanwhile, Kimberly Archie applauded Erica Jane's efforts in reaching out to the victims, telling Page Six, I think that it's even difficult for some attorneys and people who prosecute these kinds of cases to understand it. So, So I think it would be irrational to think that Erica knew. I never thought that she stole the money or anything like that. My only thing is how she came across to the victims. And now this erases all of that, obviously, because she's making a concerted effort to make the victims feel better. Jane previously told Page Six that she has empathy for her estranged husband's victims, including the widows and orphans whose loved ones in the 2018 Lion Air flight 6110 crash. Of course, I have empathy for them, Erica told Page Six last year. I have empathy for them then, and I have empathy for them now, and I trust that they will be taken care of. So there you go. Um, I like where it's, um, I like where I'm going to end. I think it's going to be fine, is what she continued to say to Page Six. So listen, Again, everybody seemed to have left that day with some sort of peace, you know, or at least a a positive step in the right direction. Um, Again, it's interesting to see everybody's tune start to change now that there's a Hulu documentary out. And, you know, it's interesting to me, which now, unfortunately, makes me question people's motives. It makes me question the integrity of the L.A. Times, who, you know, I don't believe was entirely honest in obtaining this footage and how they planned to use this footage. And listen, maybe the plans may have changed after the fact, but I don't think Erica's attorney and I don't think Erica would have participated in this. And that's my own opinion. I don't think they would have participated had they known that this was going to be a Hulu housewife and the hustler part two, especially knowing that a big piece of it was going to feature Marco Marco. Um, which again, I think has its own bias in it. But overall as a documentary, I mean, I would give it maybe a, my gut says a two out of 10, maybe a a three. I really like the last 10 minutes because I feel like you do kind of see some sort of resolution. You see some sort of hopefully peace involved. Um, I hope everybody can find some sort of, you know, healing through all of this. I hope these victims and former clients and, you know, Erica and everybody involved, I just want, people to find, I have nothing but empathy for this, you know, um, for this entire case and how it's affected so many different people. I have no skin in this game. You know, I'm not a journalist. I'm not, you know, in line in the collections line. I've always been very clear that the creditors are the ones that are first in line to receive their settlement money before the victims. Um, so, Yeah, that's why you see that like a lot of these victims will not be made whole. That's why we're, you know, you see people judging Erica for not giving over the earrings. Well, those earrings are likely to be liquidated for the trustee to keep a piece and for them to pay off Tom's creditors. The creditors aren't necessarily, there are only two cases, the Rui Gomez family and the orphans and widows case that have secured claims that a judge has, you know, agreed their money was stolen. Those are the only two that we have that a judge has actually signed off on, to my knowledge. Um, everybody else is, you know, they have claims that have yet to be actually, you know, investigated or proven at this point, which is unfortunate that this is the mess that we're in. But let's be very clear, the money that's being liquidated 
is to pay off creditors, as in bank lenders and people that Tom Girardi was friends with that have filed claims um, as creditors, which, again, is interesting. You see, their, what, like, what are their motives in doing this? They're a, a, ba- a loan lender that was a friend with Tom Girardi that shouldn't have given him a loan to begin with. But yet they approved him for a loan, considering you know there probably wasn't a, a real solid case to prove that he had the cash flow to be able to pay off that loan. So again, the web is very deep. And it's just hopefully just beginning to dismantle all of the injustices that have happened. But um, yeah, I listen, the house of the hustler, it's fine. I don't think there's anything new to it. We find out that Tom Girardi's competent to move forward with trial. Trial's not coming until May. I think if they should wanted to do a part two, part two should have not focused on Erica and Real Housewives. It should have focused on the Tom Girardi trial, which is expected to begin this May if he doesn't take some sort of plea deal. But I want to get into Vanderpump because I have a very fun conversation with Vanderpump Robs, who is on the podcast today. And I'm excited because we we get into all the Vanderpump stuff. But before we dive into that, January has come and gone, guys. But it's not too late to start your New Year's resolutions. And no, I'm not talking about getting tangled in the elliptical or eating the world's most depressing salads. Here's one that will stick. Smelling better naked. Thanks to our sponsor, Lumi, you can smell good with or without clothes all year long. Lumi is a game-changing whole-body deodorant designed by an OBGYN to not only work on the pits, but also on your feet, on your privates, and everywhere you get some odor. No matter where you use it, Lumi is clinically proven to block odor all day long thanks to its one-of-a-kind pH-optimized formula, and they have over 275,000 thousand five-star reviews to show for it. I've got my Lumi whole body deodorant. I'm wearing my toasted coconut deodorant right now. Makes me smell yummy and delicious. And now I can say that I, you know, I'm even more of a yummy snack at the gym these days. Smelling delicious. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So make the switch to Lumi and this year will be all about head-to-toe confidence. No salads required. Special offer new customers get $5 off Lumi starter pack with our exclusive code. Use code NOFILTER at lumideodorant.com. That's Lumi spelled L-U-M-E, Lumi, deodorant, D-E-O-D-O-R-E-N-T, lumideodorant.com. All right, now let's talk to some Vanderpump Rob. All right, guys, we have a very exciting little Vanderpump catch-up party today. Um, You may know him from the very popular and the very um, fun Vanderpump Robs podcast. It is the one and only Rob of Vanderpump Robs. Did the the name inspo come from, was it Vanderpump Rules or Vanderpump Dogs? Well, it it came a little bit of both, but also (laughs) Sheena, you know. When I heard that montage of her talking about Rob, I was mm. like, well, now the podcast just has to happen. You know, were you were you rooting for Rob at the time that Sheena was dating him? You know, I, maybe memories playing a trick on me, but I, <laughs> I wanted them to work out. But I think a part of me knew it would never happen. Yeah. I mean, I even that- though he had some really impressive TV hanging skills. Great TV hanging skills, great like Airbnb home up in Big Bear. Yeah. Great almost Jack's drowning episode. It was there's a lot of things going for Rob, but uh you know, you make out with someone at Toka Madeira and uh things go south. Toka Madeira will get you in trouble. <laughs> I once went to a Clamato event oh. Peter Madrigal was hosting at Toka Madeira, and it really brought in perspective on that Rob being at Toka Madeira for an event. I was like, this Rob is now at Toka Madeira for an event. And I just feel like I, I'm just two steps away from that Rob. Eh, love it. <laughs> um, so what are your thoughts on this new season of Vanderpump? We're two episodes deep. We have episode three coming this week where we see Schwartz inviting everyone to Lake Tahoe and telling Ariana she is not the number one guy in the group. Ooh. It is here's here's my my big thoughts. This this whole season had nowhere to go but sideways, right? It wasn't going to go down, 
Like the audience was going to be there. We wanted to see what was happening, but what were they going to do? So my guard was up a little bit going into season 11. Yeah. Right. I'm happy. Ariana is getting everything that's coming to her. She was treated like trash. She deserves to live a happy life. Mm -hmm. I'm there for that. But what is the storyteller? What are the storytellers doing for this? So I think see, episode two of season 11 was better than episode one, but I was a little bit let down on episode one. It just felt uh, felt like the hand of the producer was very much trying to take control and plant seeds for us on a story they want to tell rather than what's naturally happening. What do you think the story that they want to tell is? I don't think that they want to necessarily take Ariana down, but I do think they want to set the scene that like, maybe it's a little gray. Maybe uh, she's not as perfect as everyone is putting her out to be, which is, you know, BS. No one's perfect. We know that. But like she was dealt a bad hand. And when we see things like starting episodes on Ariana's messy room and then giving us a scene of Ariana being like very curt and straightforward, not overly polite. I think that's trying to signal something to the audience. And then we get scenes with Lala where Lala is a voice of reason for Ariana. And it's like, that's going to come back later. They are going to use this scene here on like the penultimate episode to like point out like, Oh, but remember Lala said this. And I feel it's a little forced. Mm. I think the reason you were disappointed with the first episode is because there was no Tom Sandoval. <laughs> I, I, you know, you're you're painting with a with a wide brush there. I was breathing nicely, like I felt good to not have Tom Sandoval on my screen for a whole episode for once. <laughs> Do you think Raquel would have changed these first two episodes and made them better, in your opinion? Oh, would she have made it better? I don't. Yes, I think maybe it would have been a little bit better, but I feel like we're, we would have gotten a, what we're getting with Schwartz, where he's iced out and Raquel's iced out. So potentially, um, I think it could have added a little bit more of a dynamic, but I also think that Raquel's doing what Raquel needs to do to uh, live her life. And I don't know if it's working necessarily, but... It's not. She's a flop. And a, <laughs> she's a flop and a loser. She should have come back to the show. Like her doing, her being like, I'm trying to protect my mental health to not come back to Vanderpump Rules. But you know what? Let me do a podcast where all I'm going to talk about it, is Vanderpump Rules. Thank you. You look like a fucking idiot. I'm sorry. It, I it tried is, to give her so a much grace. Move. I tried to it, give her so much grace. And I'm just like, every time she does something, I'm like, what, who is guiding this girl? Like she needs Tom Sandoval to start manipulating her again because <laughs> she's going off the rails. Let me tell you, I think there's like three producers on that podcast why aren't they making a coherent podcast it's like i don't so understand bad. It's, <laughs> it's so bad and of course i mean you and i we we make our shows we put a lot of thought into our shows yeah we strategically plan things and if i were to put out i mean granted i'm sure i've got people there there's somewhere who think my episodes aren't good but <laughs> if i were to ever put out an episode that was like if it was Rob Goes Rogue and you could hear all of the edits of absolutely everything of me putting sentences together, I, I wouldn't make it into, I wouldn't get one Apple positive yeah. review. It just wouldn't happen. I'm like, listen, I get it. Rachel Goes Rogue, stay rogue. Okay. Stay don't, rogue. Stay rogue. We don't, stay it's rogue like, out there. I feel I've never, aside from the first episode, I haven't been able to get through an entire episode Same. of her podcast, but like, it just feels like every time I hear a new clip, it feels like she doesn't even know what she's walking into. She's just like, she goes into the studio and the producers have, in my opinion, from listening to this, they have no idea who the fuck she is. And they're just like, so Raquel, what do you think of this week's episode of Vanderpump Rules? And she's like, oh, well, um, you know. Um, my heart was racing, but not literally racing. It didn't win first place. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, and it's just like, what am I listening? Like these producers aren't producing their talent. They they don't even seem to really know who Raquel is and they're giving her an opportunity to tell her story and she doesn't know what her own story is. And they're not than guiding her in any way no. at all. They're just cutting together what they get from turning on a mic for two hours. Now, yeah. uh, the, the thing is, is like, yeah, would she, would the season have, 
been a little bit better, maybe these first two episodes if Raquel was there. Yeah, probably because the producers of Vanderpump Rules yeah. know how to get people to do a second take yeah. and guide what they want in a storytelling. We talked about it on the podcast after episode one. We we were saying like, you know, we get what she wants to do, why she thinks that she doesn't need to be back on Vanderpump Rules, but like they will tell her story better than she can tell her own story. Yes, exactly. What it is is she wants to stay in control of the narrative. And here's mm. the thing, if there's anything we've learned from this genre, especially from Vanderpump Rules, and we've seen it with Dodie, we've seen it with yeah. Jax, you have to go through the shit. You have yes. to take it on the nose, fall on your face, hit the concrete, and then eventually you get back up, you find your footing, and as long as you continue to get back on the football field, eventually it, your story gets told and you come out on the other side. Look at Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. Erica Jane's finally in her redemption arc after getting beat up for the last two seasons. Oh, God. And sure, people don't love her right now, but she, we've, we're watching the story continue to unfold. Why? Because she decided to go through the rough seasons, get punched several times, and now we're seeing her come out on the other end. And I think that would have happened with Raquel. And I hated that Raquel went on her podcast and was like shading Lala for calling or sending her the voice note when I'm like, girlfriend, this was literally your one in. Like, even if Lala was your only ally, maybe you mm -hmm. don't really trust Lala because she came at you hard at the reunion, but she was giving you a life raft to come back onto this show. Yeah. If I were her, I would have jumped on that life raft. <laughs> stuck with Lala because listen of anybody on that cast Lala is someone you want in your court because when it's time to defend you Lala will go ruthless and toothless you do not want to be on Lala's bad side even if you are in the right yeah right like she needs she doesn't put up her dukes for many people and the fact that you are getting an olive branch from Lala and Lala admitting she's wrong yeah right like that that never happens so, yeah, I'm right there with you. I think that she's she, not only is she being taken advantage of by the producers of that show, I think her family are all the one, also the ones controlling why she's not back on the show. Like, she's not making a decision for yeah. herself. And listen, yeah. let's be honest. Her family's not very smart at this game. No. They're not in no. this game. I love the the dog thing was wild, where they oh, gave up the Lord. dog, and then all of a sudden TMZ has a picture, a, a, a leaked photo of the mom's <laughs> finger that the dog bit her, which, like, I have huh. two, two one-year-old puppies, and they're big dogs. And, mm -hmm. you know, I under... Like, listen, you need to be a responsible dog owner and care yes. for your pets responsibly. And then they don't behave like that because yes. there's no way that dog just out of nowhere bit the mom's finger like that. Well, Peter told me, I was talking with him last year, uh, Peter Madrigal. He was like, you know, they cut a scene that I was in in season 10 where I was like, I think you need to take Graham to the vet. And yeah. it was all around that time where they had had that marking on his neck and stuff. Yeah. I was like, Maybe I understand why that scene got cut, but also like you shouldn't have to have someone tell you yeah. when a dog needs to go to the vet. Yeah. And yeah, and it's just the fact that she <laughs> has, I just, every time I, I think of something Raquel has done in the last six months, I'm still perplexed by the whole situation. I thought when yeah. she went and she, fro she I thought she was going to fro uh, frolic in the garden like Bambi <laughs> and just sail off into the sunset. And we were never going to see her again. And she was going to be what a kindergarten teacher. Isn't that what she wanted to be? She listen, live that life, you know, live it. Don't live halfway in this life and halfway in what you think is freedom because you're, you're not going to get, any of it no and i mean all. this stupid podcast tells us she learned nothing in therapy in her treatment center no nah. and and it feels like she's being coerced into like sensationalizing things whatever like yeah i don't know i'm not in that room but i can take what i get as a listener and the clips that get sent to me on the social platforms yeah. but like it's you're not learning you're not growing you're not roguing at all there's nothing rogue about her. <laughs> like you're doing no. a you're, you're doing a Vanderpump Rules watch rewatch podcast or not even rewatch cuz it's a recap podcast. Like there's nothing rogue about that. And what's the long-term goal of that show? Like it, the story's going to end at some point and then what? I, I I'm sure iHeart gave her like a ten episode no, deal, and, and they're then, just trying to yeah, get it done. No, and then she's gonna do TikToks on on the internet, reviewing TJ Maxx and eating cottage <laughs> cheese. Like that's that's Raquel's future.
Fit check. I just got back from Dollar General and oh. I can't with her. I can't. Um, anyway, I'm being very sassy yeah. about Raquel right now. I, um, trust me, I feel all of those feelings in my heart too. <laughs> do you feel like Ariana should let the house go, or do you think this this dog with the bone mentality that she kind of has here, she's you know right to stick to her guns? I got to tell you, at this point in time of when they're recording, she's right to stick to her guns. Yeah, like. I, I go Do back it. and forth. For me, I'm like, let the house go for your own like mental health. Like, yes, it's, it, like it's you living with him and fighting with him over this house and threatening to call the cops. It's just creating more chaos for you, and all that's doing is hurting your own mental health. But mm-hmm. I also understand, and I t- I say this when I recap the show or when I talk about the show. I'm always like, but we're viewing this as a lens of us living this a year ago. Yes. They were filming this over the summer, which was only a couple of months after yeah. everything kind of went down. That like she's in entitled to still be a little bitter and that's I don't think it's even wrong to call her bitter. she's entitled to be angry and bitter and bitchy and all the things she wants to feel right now she's absolutely entitled to like Tom Sandoval when he went on Nick Vile's podcast he's like god I just want Raquel to move on already like forget about me man and then Nick Vile's like she's entitled to have feelings he's like well yeah, yeah but like come on and Nick's like, come on what? Like, come she's what, entitled dude? to like, be angry. Like, those are her feelings. Why are you angry that she's angry because she's not moved on? Well, and the thing is, is that, like, you know, there's the stages of grief, right? Yeah. That people tend to go through. Ariana's in anger. Yeah. And she's going to be in anger until she's not in anger. Yeah. Right? And, like, you treat someone like trash, you're going to live with a trashy attitude. Yeah. Like, that's what happens. Yes. Does do they need to find an agreement? And I'm sure it sounds like they are finally, but she needs to also process her feelings. I think we have history showing yeah. that she hasn't had much time between relationships to process shitty dudes. Yep. And unfortunately, that is perpetuated. But we're getting raw Ariana in this moment. And Tom Sandoval, you reap what you sow. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is also why I wasn't on like the audience at the when the reunion was airing about thinking like, oh, Lala and Ariana, they're being too hard on Tom and they're being too hard on Raquel. I'm like, you guys realize this was two weeks after it went yeah. down. Like, this is the first time Ariana has seen Raquel since shit went down. And even yeah. then, you see them get off set and Tom and and, and Raquel are laughing in the, in the green room and they're kind of Ooh. just like, ah, ha, 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 we're, I guess we're the bad guy. We're the villains now. It's like, you, you don't know how to separate yourself from the the faux character like you just have to be at all and it's like i was talking with a a pal of mine and she was saying that if tom sandoval or Jax or anyone like looked at themselves in the mirror and had to be truly honest without any sort of like what about isms or anything like that they would have a nervous breakdown yeah they they cannot admit that like the problems are solely on themselves. It's always like, yeah, but, or, yeah. or you did this, but uh, we saw with the, the apology that James wanted at the end of this episode. Yeah. The thing with Tom that pisses me off too, is it's like when he did his first episode of his podcast and then, he uh-huh. did, and then he did two teas in a pod. I was like, okay, maybe there's a little room. Maybe he's shown some growth. And maybe. then we see him on vile files and he just yeah. like completely shot out everything out the window which now tells me all this other remorse and and sincerity that he had on the other ones was all faux it was never real yeah it's training it's like pr training yep yeah and then he he wants to be he wants to control absolutely everything right and i'm sure he would deny this up and down he wants fame He wanted fame from the beginning of this. He wanted fame through music. He wanted fame through acting. He took this gig being on this TV show because that's some fame. When things stopped going his way and he had to realize that like being on this show is my job and is the level of fame I'm going to get, he hyper fixated on controlling all of the things he could yeah. which is all like relationships, people bringing receipts to reunions and generally being a pest to the people he has to spend every day with. Yeah. 
And and I think he was able to get away with it for so long because we did have these, you know, Jacks and um, James oh, yeah. that he was able to kind of like hide behind because they were always way worse than he was. And Ariana was the audience proxy. Yeah. Right. So if this person who constantly breaks the fourth wall to be like, yeah, I know we're on this show. It's silly, but, you know, we're hanging out with our friends. If she likes this guy. Yeah. then I guess he can't be all that bad, right? Yeah, and I think it's telling to see that now she's in this new relationship with this Dan guy, and she's also kind of reconsidering whether or not she would like to have kids. You know, I yeah. think that that says a lot as well. Um, what I think should have happened in my ideal world with Vanderpump Rules is this would have been the final season. Mm-hmm. They would have brought back Raquel. Mm -hmm. And Tom and Raquel would have gone full Spidey. Oh, man. Leaned into the villain. The same way we had the final season. Think of the final season of The Hills. Spencer and Heidi went full villain to the point where they burned themselves out. But it was such a moment. And it really just like was reality TV gold. That would have been fantastic. Because, you know, the rumor is is that what season 10 was supposed to be. Yeah. Yeah the last season and then we get we get this one so uh, my feeling is this is a bridge gap season to a potential final season in 12 i think right? this i think if they do i think i think if this is the bridge season season 12 is going to suck you know i think I, this should have been the final season because it came right off of Scandaval. There was no mm-hmm. way this season was ever going to beat last season's ratings maybe at the beginning cuz there's interest sure. yeah. make this a short season I'm talking maybe like eight episodes. Give us Tom and Raquel. We're going full-blown love affair. We're having a baby. We're going to get married in Mexico. Oh, my God. Sheena and Brock finally decide they're going to leave L.A., go to San Diego where they have another home, live a simple life over there. Ariana and Katie come and they tear it up with there's something about her that's still not open, but they come (laughs) to really, you know, throw down the lightning rod, women empowerment, we got a business and we're going to show Schwartz and Sandys, um, you know, and just really kind of let everybody finish out their character arc and just send them off with a bow. Do you think... That there's going to be a bigger, you know, because let's face it, something about her has kind of been a little bit of a joke lately to people online. Yeah. Do you think that there's going to be a bigger drop that we've all been like kind of misdirected in on what that's going to be? Because have you walked by lately? The awning's still gone. The patio's still gone. I'm not sure with it not being open yet, like, are they going to reveal something that changes something about her i don't know i don't think that there's a big bomb other than they potentially scrap the business altogether because they realize there's it's not financially worth it to keep paying the rent for the space and not have it open i know when i did someone did say like katie or someone on the after show was just like and at that time we were paying rent on something about her and i was like what is so you're not paying rent now who knows? Yeah. I mean, I get that like they ran into like permit issues. With Absolutely. The city. Yeah. And listen, that happens sometimes. Right. But yeah. also yeah. like it just seems like Ariana's not that interested in the business. And listen, she's got all these opportunities. She's doing her own thing. You it know? makes sense. And Katie's never really been much of a get off the couch kind of girl, you know? I hate to, you know, I want so much more for Katie because of having to spend all that time with, with Schwartz. Schwartz. Yeah, uh, but yeah, I mean, I don't know how much I have to hear about something about her getting new teacups. Like, no. I don't care about that. I get why you're excited about that, but that's not a plot point for your restaurant. Yeah, and like, I just, I also don't see them there. Like, like you, nah. like Schwartz is like bussing tables at Schwartz and that he's yeah. like, I'm trying to yeah. save this business. Like, I mean, he's going to do Schwartz whatever. Is posting Instagram stories to come to his yeah. restaurant. Come like, hang out. Happen. Yeah. It's like every night rare occurrence. Come hang out with me tonight at Schwartz and Sandy. I'm like, you've been doing this every day for the past four months. Like what, what is the, the plot <laughs> twist that you think you're going to throw at us? Oh, oh wait. And what happened to Jax's? It's still, I think it's still happening. I think. No, it happened. That, yeah. Like, I went, I went. Oh, I, I went, haven't been able to go yet. I went one time. And since then we have not heard a thing about Jax's. 
I heard some really expensive tables were being rented for the premiere <laughs> a couple oh, of Tuesdays the valley? ago. Yeah, no, for Vanderpump. Oh, for I'm Vanderpump. sure they're going to do it for the Valley too. Oh, but for sure. I actually DM'd Jax today about a project I'm working on, and he surprisingly wrote back very soon, but he wants to make sure he gets paid if he is oh, part yeah. of this project. And I was like, hey, you know, at least he's not dragging, dragging me along. Yeah. Put it right up front, man. Yeah. I get it. I get it. Yeah. I wonder what that number is going to be, though. Man. I'm sure it's a high one. He's I'm sh- Maybe I'll send him a pair of shoes or something. Are you Who looking knows? forward to the valley? I wasn't, but now it's starting to grow on me. I think I've been valley pilled. I think I, I need to see. Apparently, things are going wild. People are uh, People are not happy that we're friends on the show but really i just want to see Kristen back on my tv yes bring back Kristen. bring back Jax. um yeah. i feel like i'm i was surprised at how much people were like not loving the valley based off of the teaser that was released because yeah. the teaser or it wasn't even so much a teaser it was a like produced promo like it was yeah. you know it was like when they used to do summer by bravo remember and they would have all the yeah. bravo stars and they would toss the ball over like it was campy and yes. my thing is this was meant to be campy, but people are like, what is this? This is dumb. Like they didn't get it. And it was like, and they ha- and Bravo hasn't done that in a while. No. And so I think they've also gotten so many new Vanderpump viewers that are not, I mean, this is just a theory, but maybe they're just not used to the Bravo universe and that they, we've had a history of campy stuff and like silly yeah. promos over the days. But like, you can't look at that and talk shit and then see like the Tom and Tom Madam Web commercial yeah. that aired. Like it's all the same stuff. It's stupid and silly and it's not supposed to be taken too seriously. Yeah. The one thing I will say, and I'm not the only person who said this, is like I would have given a line to Kristen instead of Brittany. Yeah. On that promo. Yeah. I just I think we needed it. The excitement Kristen got being on the finale of yeah. last season like why are we not showcasing her more i get that they're trying to do like a hierarchy of the cast for this show with like jackson Brittany at the top but Brittany's not a not a lead no it's just she's never shown herself to be one but she's also never cared to be one like Brittany's always point. been like Brittany's always been like, let me just be barefoot and pregnant have my baby and like you know like Brittany's just been uh, simple from the beginning she's never wanted fame she's never really cared about money money other than providing for her family like she you think cool. so yeah you think the fame part too yeah okay I feel like she was excited about the opportunity. Yeah, I'm sure it of was being exciting. brought into that world. Yeah, I'm sure yeah. it was exciting for her at first, but then after a while, I just don't think she really cared about it. Because you mm. also look at what her life on TV has been. Her life yeah. on TV has been tumultuous. Her relationship and cheating and all this other yeah. crap that like she's not interested in any of that. Yeah, definitely not as much anymore. I think like, yeah, she probably got bit by the bug the first couple of seasons she was on, but then learned real fast that this is no good for her. So I could see that. But then, you know, going back into this one, I don't know. It'll be an interesting uh, experiment to watch the Valley. That's for sure. I'm looking forward to it. I know it's going to be a shorter season. It was originally yeah. supposed to be on Peacock, and now they're putting it on Bravo, which tells us there's probably some potential there if Bravo yeah. feels like it's strong enough to go directly to Bravo instead of Peacock. So, yeah. you know, I'm I'm looking forward to it. I want to see Dodie back from what she's talked about it. It definitely seems like there's a lot of good, you know, friction and conflict and drama mm-hmm. that I think is going to be good. Yeah. Can I ask you a question about yeah. this new season of Vanderpump Rules? What do you what do you imagine the trajectory of Schwartz to be? Has like, he ever, is he is he gonna stand up for himself or is he just gonna fall back on his old ways? I mean, I like that we've seen a different side of him in this second episode where he kind of like yeah. sits down with Tom and he's like, I expected you to be more part of the bar. And Tom's like, Well, God, man, you like kicked me out. And Schwartz is just like, But like, you should have come up with ideas, man. And then and I like, love that he was like, No, shut up. All yeah. you have to say is sorry. Yeah. Like, that's all he, you have to say. Him putting his foot down on Sandoval, yeah. even on Nick Vile, like he was like calling Sandoval out a bit. And like he yeah. like is not afraid of Sandoval anymore. And so I feel like he's becoming a little more empowered. And I think he's becoming empowered because now he's like actually had a responsibility, which is Schwartz and Sandy's. 
That's it. That I is think, definitely it. He got baptism by fire. Yep. And he doesn't have a life raft of Sandoval anymore. Or Katie. Think about it. Katie True. ran yeah. their oh, life yeah. for yeah. Uh, up until the divorce. And then once the divorce came, he got Schwartz and Sandy's. And Sandoval was very much the driving ship there. And that's why you see Schwartz over here promoting Schwartz and Sandy's on Instagram and, and telling people to come on down and them doing Vanderpump watch parties there. Like, you know, he's now had to really grow up. So I think... Yeah. But I also think he's not interested in any of the fame or any of this either. Like, I think he would be really cool letting the show wrap up. Like, if the show were to end, I could see, like, Lala and Sheena maybe jumping on over to the valley, right? I could see that, too. I would also love to see a Lala, Sheena, Crappy Lake style show. Yeah, like, Give me a short fun. one. I had Sheena on the podcast, like, last year or something to do, like, a what spinoffs would Sheena like to do? And I believe that was one of them. But the one I really liked was she would want to do like a travel, like food show. And if Lala and Sheena did like tacos and tequila where Lala chose the food and I know she doesn't drink, but like Sheena chose the drinks and like they merged together. That would be, I'd watch eight episodes of that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. I think Lala and Sheena will definitely stay on TV. The rest of them, I don't think... The only one that would want to is Sandoval, and I just don't think the opportunities are there for him. No, I don't don't either. Someone will attempt to give him a show on another network, and it it won't work. I mean, I don't know about you, but I couldn't get through Special Forces or Stars on Mars because it just was not the same at all. And Vanderpump Villas coming up, and... I don't know what to think about that at all. I, I will watch, but I mean, if, I hear- if anything, it's got the most potential of the other spinoffs that she's done with yeah. Vanderpump dogs, which was a flop. She yeah. had that dog competition show. She had oh overserved on E, um, you know, that like, it's just, it's never really stuck. I think Vanderpump Villa has potential. I hear there's like a rumor that someone on Vanderpump Villa was like, and I don't remember who it is right now, so sorry, don't don't come for me, everyone. But like, was dating a former Vanderpump Rules cast member, oh. and like that's what got her on to Villa. I I don't know. Maybe it'll play out on the season. I got to do some digging on that one. Oh, I haven't heard that. Yeah, but you know what I did catch was the. Did you see Billy Lee has launched a podcast? I saw that popped up, but I have yet to listen. I I'm not a- sure. I want to. I caught a clip of it. Um, I haven't okay. listened to the whole thing, but I caught a clip of it where Billy makes Sandoval play Kill Bang Mary. Oh, fun. With Ariana. Jesus. Sheena. And Lala. No. Yes. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. And he's like, God, I would totally kill Lala because I don't even like Lala. And he's like, you know, <laughs> Sheena. He's like, I couldn't marry Sheena because like her OCD would probably like piss me off. So like I'm going to bang Sheena and then like Ariana I guess like we were together for so long that like yeah that would make sense if we got married I was like oh Ew. my god Sandoval you gotta go with the answers you don't want to give in that that's what's gonna drive the clicks man but also say you wanna marry Lala that's what we want. yeah <laughs> how about you Zach what's yours for those three um I would marry Sheena, shag Lala, and kill Ariana. Wow! Wow! I just feel like Ariana's a little, like she's very headstrong, but I just feel like compatibility-wise, she's too headstrong for me, and we would not get along in okay. a healthy marriage. Um, Sheena, I feel like is not as headstrong. That I feel like you know we could we could go the distance with that, and Lala, I just feel like would be a great time in bed. Well, I don't think anyone's going to argue with you on that one, <laughs> for sure. She lets us know in every single episode. Yeah. <laughs> I can't give her a Range Rover, but, you know. <laughs> Maybe a Honda Civic. Yeah. But no, I was just like, how is Billy Lee even asking this question? Like, what is, why? Well, because she, I mean, we know how the people are going to look at it and like hate watch it or whatever. But like also Billy Lee, what's, what's your end game here? Are you a comic now? Are you 
still trying to get on TV? What what is going on? Apparently, she's been doing a lot of like stand up gigs lately. But yeah, she's been doing a lot of stand up. Good for her. Now she has this podcast, um, which is the natural trajectory for a stand up comic. Yeah. Who would who would be your options in the Kill Bang Mary? Oh Lord, Ariana, Lala, and Sheena. Well, I think I would marry Sheena. Yeah. Bang Ariana and kill Lala. Really? It's the t-shirt on that got you, right? It's it truly is the t-shirt. It's just <laughs> comforting, you know, and like a little bit different, but Lala just, she says too many things that make me go, that is so contradictory to everything else you've said this episode. <laughs> like, I don't think I would be able to like live in that vicinity uh, for very long at all. You wouldn't be able to live in La La Land. Uh, definitely not. Definitely not. Uh, well, we'll see. I mean, Sandoval just needs to stop doing podcast. Like Nick Vile and now Billy, like every show that he's gone on lately has just continued to tank his reputation more than I thought he was even capable of. And just to take a note from the Who TF Knows podcast, like Sandoval needs to clean his pants if he's going to go on a video podcast. Like you cannot show up in dirty clothes, man. It just doesn't work. He doesn't have any money. He has to go on tour to pay for his, his bills. But he's also pay paying bills. the band, and he's also a very generous how, guy. I genuinely don't know how he's making money off of the most extra shows, because ticket sales weren't really there, and you have to no. pay this, what, 16-person band. Like, and I don't care what guarantee you're getting for an event. It's not 16 people walking away going, Wow, we really paid rent this month. Not happening. Exactly. I mean, at best, I mean, I feel like a standard fee would maybe be like 10K. Um, maybe, yeah. Is is like kind of what these venues, the size of the venues, that's what they can budget for a band to perform. And then he's coming in with like a 16-person band that you have to cut 10 grand 16 ways. Like that's, you know. And when they were doing these tours that they're talking about this season, like – a lot of the stuff we saw online was them opening for other cover bands. Yeah. So if we're also splitting this guarantee with Yachty by Nature or whoever it is, <laughs> it is. Yep. It ain't going far, but you know, more power to them. I love that that cover band lucked in to finding someone who wants to pay them to get more popular gigs because I'm sure they were a cover band before doing you know, talking heads shows or something. Yeah. And then this guy comes in and he's like, Hey, I'll pay you to let me be your singer. And they're like, hell yeah. Let's make <laughs> more money than we were, you know, doing weddings and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Good for them. What do you have thoughts on a uh, Jason Tom's podcast producer slash only friend slash band manager? Which he was the one that was on the most recent episode, right? Where he yeah, was telling him, throw yeah. the party, man. Yeah. I mean, clearly not a great friend. No. He's like, a, just an, an enabler. enabler. Think, yep, maybe. he's an enabler for sure. Yeah. There is, who's the, um, damn it, there's another one that I can see. His, uh, uh, the the jeweler. Kyle. Oh, Kyle Chan. Kyle, Kyle Chan. Chan. Kyle yeah. Chan. I think he's a better influence on Sandoval, and he's probably a better friend. But, I mean, clearly from what we're seeing from Billy Lee and now from Jason, it just doesn't feel like the people that he has around him are that are, – are, are helping him. I mean, sure, it seems like he's nah. trying, but Sandoval's just so used to revolving – himself around yes people that are just going to mm -hmm. agree and cheer him on i'm yep. glad poor Anne finally quit working for him yeah thank goodness Anne. you you saw the light and you got out of it. but hey we all know what it's like being in la and trying to get a job and you know that probably was a great job for three months yeah i think and then it was a terrible year after that yeah. but man yeah, Tom's surrounding himself with a lot of yes people. Tom, I think he's about to, he still hasn't hit rock bottom. And I think once these people start leaving him as well, we will see. I don't think we're ever going to get a, a clear headed Tom by any means, but no. he is so close to learning his lesson and he will do everything in his power to not learn it. 
literally everything in his power yeah. to not learn it. And every time yeah. you you think he's had like a sliver of growth and you're like, oh, maybe it's like he takes 10 steps back because I think when he gets that sliver of growth, He's mm-hmm. just like, it like validates his ego. So then he like doubles down yes. on where he was before. And it's like. <sighs> yeah. And it's like you, he's a give an inch, take a mile sort of person. And he's never going to look back. He's always like, I always want to just, if I make a plan, then like that could go wrong. So if I never make a plan, nothing can go wrong. And yeah. he's just explaining why everything in his life goes wrong. Yep. Well, when you only have an inch, all you want is a yard. Yeah, that's true. And you know what they say, an inch is a cinch and a yard is hard. (laughs) Gotta gotta go small, Tom. Anyway. Oh, man. I feel like Tom and Raquel, they just are their own worst enemy and they just can't help themselves get out of (laughs) this rut that they keep digging themselves in. Give us the Raquel Tom spinoff. If they, if they, you know, in five years, once all these shows are canceled, bring them back. And we'll we'll see where they're at yeah, now. We're gonna see them in like a um, a surreal world. Tom yeah. and Raquel join the house. I would love to see them go on traders together. Could you imagine oh, like Larsa, shit. like Larsa and Marcus? Tom and Raquel are the next Dude. duo to go on. Raquel would win traders from being oblivious to what's going on. Yeah, like she would like luck into winning traders. She would be like the sh- like Sheree's probably going to go all the way to the end because yes. of this season because she's not good at the game. Nobody <laughs> paying attention. To- like she's just going to escape by and she's going to be like, "Look at I won," and we're going to be like, "What? How?" <laughs> yeah, Raquel will do that, but actually Tom's going to be on like the next season of The Floor. Or whatever, <laughs> like that's the level he's gonna have to hit. He's oh, gonna take God. over for Rob Lowe on season yeah. one, season two of The Floor. Oh man! Well, Rob, thank you for joining me today. This thank you so fun. much for having me, Zach. This was a blast. Well, everybody, where can they listen to your podcast? It's available on all podcast platforms, correct? Yeah, Vanderpump Robs with an S on all podcast platforms, and I'm hosted by the Sonar Network. So if you reach out to me on Instagram at Vanderpump Robs, need any help, I'll show you where you can listen. There you go. Go give Vanderpump Robs some love. Subscribe. Give him a nice Apple Podcast review because that's what we love. We love good Apple Podcast reviews. Give him a follow on the gram. Can they slide into your DMs? Anytime. (laughs) Just like Tom did to Raquel while she was dating James. Um, (laughs) Thank you guys for tuning in to No Filter with Zach Peter. Go follow Vanderpump Robs on all the social meds. Go and subscribe. If you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts, leave me a nice podcast review because I do love that validation. If you're watching this on Spotify, hi guys, leave me a nice uh, Spotify review or if you're streaming this on YouTube be sure to hit the like button drop a comment below and let me know what you've been loving and what you have not been loving about Vanderpump this season and maybe if you have a couple new strategies for Tom and Raquel on how to pivot out of this maybe it's they launch a podcast with Bethany Frankel together there we go <laughs> Bethany can save them the big shot with B- with Bethany Frankel season two um all right guys thanks you can always keep up with me at just plain zach all over the internet or follow the podcast at no filter with zach and i will catch you guys tomorrow all right have a good one ciao for now bye